So, yesterday I watched a video, and it was about how we can determine what is a real artist. And this was a video that was presented by two YouTubers that I respect greatly. And, um, you know, I always appreciate their points of view. And it got me to thinking, you know, like, what is a real artist? You know, because that sounds kind of pejorative to me. You know what I mean? Like, to me, you're being pretty judgmental if you're, you're like becoming the gatekeeper of what is a real artist, you know, what is a great artist or whatever. Um, I happen to think that um, nobody should judge anybody else uh, with regards to whether or not they're a real artist, you know, no matter what level they're at creatively or career-wise or whatever, like you never know where somebody is in their process, you never know what somebody is doing at that particular moment, you don't know anything, you know what I mean? Like, why are you even thinking about anybody else? That's what I'm wondering, you know? And, and this video in particular was about, you know, you can't be a real photographer if you're using a digital camera. Seriously? I mean, some of the greatest photographers in the world, most of the great photographers in the world right now are using digital cameras because that's the easiest camera to get. And, um, you know, then, then it got deeper as far as like, you can't be a real photographer unless you're using manual settings. And, you know, then they brought up the fact that there's one photo photographer in particular, um, I don't remember his name, who actually has an assistant who sets all the settings in his camera and then hands this guy the camera and he takes the photos. So it's really all about composition of what he's seeing and, and how what he sees is apparently unique compared to anybody else. I mean, you might be looking at this video right now and thinking, he's not a real artist because what's he using as a microphone? I'm using an LG V40 phone. But you would be way off base with that because actually an LG V40 or an LG V30 or an LG V60 or whatever, they use 24-bit 96 kilohertz audio. That's what I can record into this phone. I can actually record 24-bit 192 kilohertz. That is like Pro Tools level, like the highest level, like if you're gonna do a recording for Sony Records or any record company, you're gonna use 24-bit audio. And so really there's no big difference between what I'm doing right here and what a professional recording artist might use or a professional filmmaker using a lavalier mic, you know, or an overhead boom mic or something like that. It's really more about the converters and what the audio is being processed as, you know, what it's going to sound like. You know, this probably sounds pretty good, right? And so I just, you know, again, I think it's like really kind of condescending and holier than thou for anybody to judge whether or not somebody is a real artist, a real painter, a real filmmaker, a real musician, a real sculptor, you know, whatever, you know, a real dancer. Like, you know, some people like John Coltrane and some people like Metallica, you know? Some people, you, you can't account for people's taste, you know? Look at somebody like Jimi Hendrix. You know, when Hendrix first started playing the guitar the way he started playing it, because Hendrix played jazz. I mean, I don't know, you know, like a lot of people don't know that he actually played with Duke Ellington. Like Hendrix was a great musician, but when he started playing the guitar, a lot of people were actually offended by the way he was playing. And like feedback, feedback was like, whoa, get rid of that. You know what I mean? But he used it creatively and he made it beautiful and he made it emotional. He made it visceral, you know? You know, there, there are musicians who, you know, like people judge based on your technical proficiency. You know, can you play like Oscar Peterson? Can you play a million notes per measure or something like that? You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, and it's actually quite impressive and something that, you know, I aspire to as a guitar player, you know, is to be able to play with that kind of technique. However, you know, my favorite musicians of all time, like Miles Davis, for example, who's one of my favorite musicians, that dude, he could play one note and bring you to tears, like bring you to your knees. I mean, you don't need to play a whole bunch of stuff. You know, so there are musicians who play very simple, you know, um, who play very like um, just emotionally. And again, you know, there's nothing wrong with technique. There's nothing wrong with education. I mean, there's a lot of artists who didn't go to school. You know, I know a lot of filmmakers and a lot of theater artists. They feel kind of salty about people who didn't go to school like me. You know, they don't appreciate that because they and I get it, too, because they spent a lot of money and they spent a lot of time in school. But at the end of the day, 
I would say that there are very few theater artists who have been on stage more than me. You know, I've applied it in real life. You know, I've studied. I mean, I take my craft very, very seriously. And there are a lot of artists like me who didn't go to school. And in fact, one of my directors once said to me, man, I'm glad you didn't go to theater school because they would have ripped everything that is special about you out of you in theater school because you're breaking every rule. But people seem to love what you do. He goes, I love what you do, you know, because it's just you. There's nobody like you. I can't, I can't compare you to anybody else. And that, I think, is the key to being a, a great artist or a real artist is just being genuine, you know, just trying to do, you know, the best that you can do that nobody else would do because nobody does you better than you, you know. That is the sign of an artist to me. Anybody who intends to create something and want to share it with people, you know, because to me, creativity is about community. It's about sharing. It's about touching people and moving people. You know, it's about an exchange, a beautiful shared experience. I often call it, and you know that that's you know for me that's it. You know, the only thing that that would bother me about somebody who's creating is if they're lazy. You know, if I feel like they're just going out there and kind of disrespecting the fact that people are taking their time and sometimes spending their money. To come spend time with them and receive their art, and if they're just like throwing some stuff out there without any genuine intention, like real serious, you know, um, serious approach to what they're doing, that bothers me, you know, because um, you know. But it bothers me for like one second because then I could just leave, you know. It doesn't bother me like, oh my god, I'm so offended. It's just not really interesting to me. I guess is a better way to put it. You know, I'm really interested in people who are passionate about what they do, who really care, who are trying to create meaningful, disruptive work. You know, like that's that to me is art. You know, that that stops us in our tracks for a second and kind of takes us out of our mundane, you know, day to day life, the news, and you know, our jobs or whatever. You know, you happen to be doing with your day to day life. Maybe you're just raising your kids, or you know, maybe you're just a college student or whatever. And suddenly you're in this space, you know, and like in the case of theater, you know, you're in this sacred performance space, and all these people show up from all different walks of life, and you perform something, you create these characters, and you build this story, and you kind of take everybody into your world, and now we're all living in the same place together, and we are totally disrupted from our day-to-day -day experiences, you know, our day-to-day -day life. Like suddenly we're here together. And maybe thinking in a way that we wouldn't have thought before we stepped into that theater. It's the same thing with any song, you know, or a film. I mean, films, you know, they they transport us in a way that is, you know, it's like good nutrition. You know what I mean? It. How many times have you seen a movie that's inspired you and you just feel so good? You know, you might have felt like crap before you started watching that film, and all of a sudden you feel inspired, you feel moved, you're crying, you're laughing, you're thinking about things that that it reminds you of in your own life. You know, this story that had nothing to do with you is suddenly all about you. That is great art. You know, I remember once I went to a play, and I was sitting there with somebody, and I said, you know, clearly. This play sucks. Like this is the worst production I've ever seen in my life. It's horrible, you know. Technically, it's like, you know, people are losing their line. Like, you know, the lights were all messed up. It was hard to see things. You know, it was the set was set up in a way where it just nothing made sense. But for some reason, I was feeling so much, you know. And I was like, clearly this sucks. But this is like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, because it was a bunch of kids. Probably performing for the first time in their lives, you know, it was at an elementary school, and it was so genuine and so sincere, and it just it moved me to tears, because it was about a little kid who had autism, and they dedicated it to a kid in their class, and that is high art for me, like that that's amazing to me, and so, yeah, I don't know, you know, sometimes I like to just like. Walk around my apartment, and I might look at something, and, and it interests me. Like just say my window, and I just might want to shoot it from different angles, and it makes me feel a certain kind of way. You know, I mean, is that art? I think it's art. You know, 
I'll even just go like look out my bathroom window. I mean, in the backyard of my, you know, outside my bathroom window is just like a bunch of crap. You know, people are just throwing shit back there, you know, contractors working on stuff or whatever. You know, there's overgrown trees. It's the back side side and the back of a building. There's really nothing interesting there. But if I shoot it in a certain kind of way, it could look really beautiful. It could look kind of, you know, like scary or um, very dramatic or, you know, it can look like a lot compared to what it actually is, which is basically nothing. But it can make you feel or it, it can make you feel things that you were are surprised about or it could take you to a place that you weren't expecting to be taken. That can happen. Is that art? You know, does it really mean anything? I think it does because why do we why do we go to a play or why do we go to the you know the theater why do we go to see a movie you know why do we go to a museum we're going because we want to feel something right we want to feel something we want to add to our lives you know we need we need more than just walking around every day and and trying to make enough money to pay our bills you know and so art to me is feeling something that's why hendrix is so amazing that's why prince was so amazing you know that's why miles and coltrane and people like that keith jarrett you know i remember when i was a little kid my father walked into my room and i had my headphones on and he could tell that i was kind of like really being kind of focused on where i was and he was like what are you listening to and i said keith jarrett and he's like who's keith jarrett and he goes and i said to him it doesn't matter but i will tell you this that i don't ever want to feel any differently than i feel right now And I was a little kid, you know, but but I was so moved. It was the Colin concerts, and um, it's a legendary album, you know. I think it's a four-part album, and I just I listened to that music, and it changed my whole life. Which sounds kind of corny and dramatic and whatever, but it really did. It changed my whole life. It made me want to do that, you know. It made me want to make stuff that makes people feel like that. Like the first time I saw the movie Cinema Paradiso, it's my favorite film, you know. And I remember I, I felt so deeply about it. I was paralyzed with emotion when that film ended. You know, there's a scene at the end, in a you know one guy looking at a screen of some clips of films, and I don't want to give it away in case you want to go see the movie, or you know you want to find it online or whatever. But um, I just remember feeling like, wow, you know, like I. I, I couldn't believe how I was feeling. You know, I just felt so, so much. And I think that was my first experience of great cinematic art. You know, like the music. You know, Ennio Morricone created this score that was so perfect. Like every time I hear that music now, and you know, people, that music is so powerful that people cover it online all the time. Pat Metheny, you know, plays solo guitar, the Cinema Paradiso theme. You see all these people playing piano and strings, and it's such a beautiful score, and it so perfectly hugged the story. That um, you know, that's great art to me. Now, some people not, might not be into that. You know, some people might prefer to hear the Red Hot Chili Peppers or Jay Z or something like that. You know, Beyonce, and and that's all great art too. You know, that's the beauty of it. You know that's why we shouldn't be, you know, talking about what is a real artist. You know. So one time I was walking down the Grand Concourse, and I was going home in the Bronx, and I ran into a friend of mine named Tongo, Tongo Eisen Martin, who's a great writer. He's a real artist, a meaningful artist, and that's a whole other story that I'm not not going to get into now. You should Google him and find him and. He's he's amazing. But anyway, we ran into each other, and I was kind of surprised because I thought he had moved back to San Francisco. But here we are in the Bronx, and we ran into each other randomly like that, which is pretty crazy. And so anyway, we were standing in front of the Bronx Museum of Art, and we were going to see an exhibit for the Young Lords. That's why he went there, and I w- I was going there for the same reason on my way home. And so we walked in, and we were just talking, you know, we were hanging out, you know. And he and I were pretty similar in that we were kind of outliers as artists, you know. We neither of us really liked the conventions or the parameters that people set up for what poetry should be or the way you should do your art or whatever. Like we just we're both the kind of people that just do what we want to do, you know. And so we were talking about that, and I was asking him, you know, what's going on. He says, you know. He goes, I'm always trying to like, you know, have some kind of impact with my work. And、um, I realized that I can't do it on the outside. 
Like I have to get on the inside to make any kind of, you know, any kind of impact, you know, to have an impact, to make any kind of contribution. I got to get on the inside, you know. I was like, wow. He goes, you know, you should do the same thing. And um, we kept talking. And then he said to me, the other thing I realized is, you know, you got to become a better person to become a better artist. He said, that's something I really understand now. And I was like, wow, you have to become a better person to become a better artist. Never truer words have been spoken like that is real art, you know. Um, I think art is about empathy, you know, art is about compassion, art is about anger, you know, art is about frustration, art is about communication, connecting with people. That's what it's about, you know. And empathy is everything, you know. Um, I think that if you have that, if you understand that you are just like a speck of sand in this ocean of humanity, that nothing that you do is going to change the world. Like, you cannot change the world. But if you do your part, you know, if you just take the responsibility to do just a little bit every day, and if that's your intention with all of your work, whether you're a musician or a sculptor or a painter or a filmmaker or a theater artist or whatever you are, a dancer, if you are intending to raise the bar of humanity a little bit, you know, it sounds like grand, you know what I mean? But I'm saying, if that's your intention, and if you understand that it ain't all about you, I think if everybody does that, imagine if every artist did that, man, then things would change. And that's real art. You know, real art is anything that is empathetic, compassionate, dedicated, committed, you know, it comes in so many different forms. And it's not just one thing. It's not just one kind of person. It's not just, it's not just a certain level of technical proficiency. It's not about that, you know. You know what, I'll tell one more story and then I'll end this video for real. A long time ago, I decided I wanted to go to Asbury Park, New Jersey, which was crazy because I had never been to Asbury Park, New Jersey in my life, but I had heard a lot about it and I was always kind of curious about it. And so one morning I got up at like 4.30 in the morning and drove down there from New York City. So it took me about two hours to get there. And when I got there, I couldn't get close to the city. And they call it the city by the sea. It's a Jersey Shore town. And they call it the city by the sea because it's not like your typical, you know, shore kind of city. It's like it's a real city. It's got these big buildings. It's like ancient ruins. You know, it's these old abandoned buildings, these beautiful theaters. And there's an old carousel building, the boardwalk. It's like a very historic place. But in the 60s, actually, it was a big destination kind of place to go to in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. People used to go there for vacations all the time, and it was this big kind of like Coney Island kind of place. But in the 60s, they had these race riots like they did around the country in other places, and Asbury Park burned down, like just burned to the ground. And the state of New Jersey just left it there for a long time. Like it just sat there like that, and it became a city of crackheads and crystal meth heads and just nothing. It was just impoverished, and it was left. But but the buildings remained, and of course, artists descended upon Asbury Park and kind of took it over and squatted in these buildings and ran their own electricity and their plumbing and everything, and they just created art, and it became a home for visual artists. Like, you'd see murals everywhere, and it was, it was just that kind of place, and that was what really interested me. So anyway, I got down there. I couldn't get close to the city because there were all these people. And so there used to be this gigantic Coca-Cola factory down there. It was like about two miles from the beach. I don't think it's there anymore, but it was this old, beautiful building, like a factory building. So I parked by that building, and then I walked down what is, I believe it's Asbury Avenue. Like, I don't know what it's called up there, two miles away, but I think it's Asbury Avenue, or maybe it's First Avenue, something like that. But I'm walking down, and I'm walking past all these old, beautiful houses, these Dutch colonials with porches and people hanging out. And, you know, I go by this old Italian restaurant that kind of reminded me of Arthur Avenue in the Bronx or, you know, Mulberry Street, Little Italy in Manhattan. And it's just the vibe feels so cool, you know, like all these people hanging out, really diverse, you know. Um, I was just falling in love a little bit more with every block. And so I get all the way down to the beach, and now I'm hearing music. And I'm telling you, there are hundreds of thousands of people walking around. I'm not exaggerating, like hundreds of thousands of people everywhere. Now, this was shortly after 9-11. 
I'm hearing music. And it's Bruce Springsteen. And it's loud, so I could tell it's live. There's a concert going on. And so now I'm kind of excited because Bruce Springsteen is playing live. The, and, and the thing is, I hated Bruce Springsteen. Like I was so, nobody was less interested in Bruce Springsteen than me. Like I was like, man, you know, I came from a jazz background and then I love R&B music, you know. So to me, singers were like Aretha and Chaka Khan and Luther Vandross and people like that, you know, Brian McKnight. To me, Springsteen was like, what? Like, I, don't, I didn't even understand what people saw in him, but I wasn't really listening. I didn't know him at all. I was judging him just based on the little short little clips that I had heard here and there, you know, but I never really listened. So, but anyway, it was still cool. There were all these people and he was playing. So I make my way down to the beach. He's in front of this gigantic old theater. I forget the name of it, but um, it's this big old building down there. That's like, you know, a convention center. It was convention hall. And so he's playing right in front of it. And there he is, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band out on the beach with like a couple of hundred thousand people, you know, filling up the beach, the boardwalk, the street for blocks. And I'm telling you, he's playing this song called Rise Up, or maybe it's called My City in Ruins. I'm not sure what the title is, but um, if you saw the concert right after 9-11 at Madison Square Garden on TV, he played that song there, and I remember that was the first time I became kind of interested in him because I watched him do that song, and I was like, wow, like I was stunned. It was so powerful, and I'll never forget, you know, they didn't allow audience to that show because it was a, they thought it was a security risk at that time because, you know, 9-11 had just happened, and they put together this big concert with Sting and all these big artists, Clapton, all these people. Um, so anyway, that's the first time I really felt Springsteen a little bit but I forgot about it quickly but anyway I'm out here on the beach and I'm listening to him and he's singing and he's playing and doing this song and people are singing at the top of their lungs and they are weeping I mean I'm talking about sobbing hundreds of thousands of people and I was just becoming overwhelmed with this whole thing like the whole vibe you know and um, so I stayed and I'm watching him play all these songs and I'm telling you these people they knew every word to every single song and they were singing along with him and it was like it was like a religious experience it was crazy it was just amazing and um i remember thinking to myself wow i get it like that right there that dude right there that's a real artist because i have never seen other than maybe stevie wonder when i saw him in concert i had never seen somebody connect like that with an audience like it was so intimate there were hundreds of thousands of people and it was intimate it was visceral it was so emotional people were so moved you know and so touched by this whole thing and that guy i'm telling you he he gave every ounce of his spirit he was this boy was singing from his spleen i mean it was amazing and i just thought that dude man that's a a great singer and then it suddenly you know I started to really study other singers and I realized the value of Bob Dylan who I couldn't stand and all of a sudden I fell in love with Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger and people like that and that's who Springsteen kind of comes from 